so today we're looking at Proverbs. Um, and uh, with Proverbs, we're looking at uh, one of the best known types or genres of literature because the genre is inherent in the title. We get the word Proverbs uh, from this passage in Scripture, but we tend to associate it with uh, the types of um, literary writing that we find in the later chapters of Proverbs. I think I talked about this last time when I was talking about the encomium because we talked about Proverbs uh, 31 there in relation to the virtuous wife. It's in Proverbs. And it is a proverb, but it's also an encomium. And so you can note here that often with a lot of the forms uh, I'm talking about, there's conflation of categories. So we can get encomia that are also proverbs. Uh, and we can see features of, of, uh, of many types of literature overlapping. So some things can be illustrations of multiple uh, types. In terms of scripture, uh, there are probably four main books that we would associate with uh, Proverbs or wisdom literature, and that is Proverbs, obviously, but also Ecclesiastes, uh, a great deal of Job, the book of Job, and the book of James, the epistle of James. One of the hardest books in scripture to read if you don't understand the genre and read it uh, as, as wisdom literature. But that doesn't make it proverb, a proverb. A proverb is a type of wisdom literature. And it's uh, unlike the rest of, let's say, Ecclesiastes or Job or James, although James has bits of this, it tends to be very concise and aphoristic an aphorism is a short, pithy saying. <clears throat> and really, the Bible as a whole is a repository of aphoristic wisdom. I think even though it's pretty long, it, takes you, it would take you a fair wee while to read the entirety, um, you would still find that there's, it, it's condensed wisdom disseminated there. And some chapters seem even more than others on that front, and those are the ones that tend to be written in poetry. But even those that are not written entirely in poetry that are more aphoristic tend to be like Genesis 1 to 3. It's very, a lot is being said in a very short space of time. But um, we're going to associate Proverbs with a very brief type of statement, and there are proverbial statements throughout Scripture you know, dotted about here and there. And it is central, uh, the central function of Proverbs uh, are to teach, as you would expect with disseminating wisdom. Uh, it's primarily there to, to teach. Now, I talked about wisdom literature, and it would also be there to teach, but note how different the type of teaching the book of Job has. We're, we're, I'm going to take a whole class to look at Job, so... I won't spend too much time here. But look at how different the type of teaching are, is presented in the book of Job as opposed to uh, the book of Proverbs and as opposed to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is talking about the vanity of life, Job about the suffering of life, all of which requires uh, wisdom to understand. It's not a matter of knowledge, it's a matter of how do I live with this? Because that's what with wisdom literature addresses, is right living. Not just truth, but um, because truth can be presented in very abstract terms, uh, terms that are amenable to systematic theology. So we can talk about doctrine, we can talk about concepts, lean more in the direction of philosophy. Philosophers tend to like systematic theology, those of a philosophical mindset. Um, but here it's more the lived experience, and we're giving, we're giving uh, 
thought and attention and language to the reality of an embodied human experience. So it will take into account suffering uh, and with that psychology and with that social relations. And so it humanizes doctrine and humanizes life. So it's a, it's a very practical type of writing that is enormously helpful. My, my wife's favorite book is the Epistle of James. Um, what you must not do with, with, uh, with wisdom literature is use it as if it were written like other doctrines. So the Epistle of James must not be read as a doctrinal book. If you read it that way, you end up with terrible consequences. The reason you're sick and die is because you lack faith. I've heard people say this to people who are sick. You just, if you just, it says in scripture that you just don't have faith. You just don't need to have faith, and the person responds, but I do have faith, and yet I'm still sick. So then they start thinking about maybe there's an area where they're lacking faith, and this is just pushing them. It's a test of their faith, which maybe they lack, and now they have another problem. They have a problem that they're fearful that they don't have faith, which is the only thing they actually had. So they're they're even more greatly traumatized than before by somebody citing scripture to demonstrate um, that this is the solution to all the problems because, and this is a very Christian thing to do, isn't it? It's the Protestant thing. You just need to have faith. All you need is faith here. That's what James says. But James is not talking about uh, the reason that sickness and death happens is because of faithlessness. Sickness and death happens because of original sin. There's no doubt about that. And as a consequence, people will die. And so there's some sort of remote connection with this. But behind every cold that you have is not the devil and your lack of faith. So it is, um, it must not be misconstrued. It is generally true. And it's, it, so it is generally true that people get, suffer all sorts of ailments because they lack faith. So if you do your psychology or sociology or health and human services, you will find that there is a social determinant of human health that will include um, faith in God. And, and studies will, <clears throat> will show that people who have faith in God tend to be healthier and happier. They have one few, uh, whether it's because of God's direct help or whether it's simply because they're no, not traumatized, uh, there, there's a, a foundation of certitude there in the midst of a storm. And that has great benefit. Yeah, they're, they're, God is directly benefiting them and blessing them uh, through having faith in him. But that doesn't remove the sickness, per se. It might. There are there's such thing as miracles. Miraculous healings do happen. But there's no guarantee that, and you don't uh, fail to get miraculous healing because you lack faith. It's a gift from God. It might come, it might not come. Um, but what we do get in uh, Proverbs are general statements about life. So they're generally true. And because they're generally true, it's wise to act this way. Because if it's generally true, then it's probably true for you. It's very important, actually. So wisdom is not to be discounted. But there are exceptions to the rule, and that's important. Whereas if it were doctrine, there are no exceptions to the rule. Wisdom allows exceptions. Because sometimes somebody is being put forward for God's purposes to illustrate something, maybe to that person or more, perhaps more for everyone in general, like Job. We'll come to that, as I said. Job did nothing wrong, and yet he suffered terribly. God had a purpose for that. It's not the case that God is going to make everybody suffer like Job, but it was there to show something about 
the purpose, God's purpose of suffering that may transcend punishing sin, right? So it, there's a wisdom uh, to suffering there, even if somebody has faith, you can still be like Job, having faith and still suffer, and God can still have a purpose. This is a, this is a very important teaching in that sense. So it's general, it's generally true. And uh, so we note that it is general, but it's also, it tends to be very specific. So it combines, it's a double quality. I talked about earlier about the double quality of scripture in general, that it's, it's very realistic, but at the same time, it combines that with the miraculous, that double view. Two things that were told post enlightenment that don't go together, the realism and the supernatural, these things don't go. Scripture throws them together all the time. Here's the reality, and here's something that transcends uh, an empiricist, reductionist view of science. Here's something greater than that, and the, it holds the two together. It requires you to accept both of them. Wisdom literature pushes you to accept the general, but it presents it in very specific terms. So there's the double quality. It's very specific, but it's also generally true. It's also um, particular to a situation, and yet also universally true. And wisdom literature is disarmingly simple. Very easy to remember. That's part of its beauty. And yet, despite the simplicity, seems profound. When Jesus preaches in the Sermon on the Mount, I think some of it is proverbial. We could look at the Sermon on the Mount as an instance of proverb. It's a funny sort of proverb, but still. Wise, pithy saying this that seemed to contain more than the brevity of the expression might lead us to conclude. And when, the, when Jesus preaches, and what we have in the Sermon on the Mount, the, the crowd is amazed because they've never heard such teaching. It's, he's not talking about abstract doctrine. He's, he's talking about doctrine applied to life. It seems to have such relevance. The Beatitudes. So, um, I talked about some of the specifics there. Uh, the English poet Francis Thompson uh, spoke about the Bible as a treasury of gnomic wisdom. And I'll just continue the quote. I mean its richness in utterances of which one could, as it were, chew the cud. You can sit there and chew over it. You know how cows just chew and chew and chew and they're masticating as part of the digestion. Proverbs are like that. You don't want to read Proverbs just to get through the book to read it all in one sitting. It's a rich fare. There's a benefit from reading them all together, by the way, but you can also just read one proverb and reflect on it, or, or a chapter, if you will. This has long been recognized, uh, go on, and biblical sentences have passed into the proverbial wisdom of our country, says Francis Thompson, the English poet. So there are certain proverbs that have now become English proverbs. And in every country, there are proverbs that are not from scripture, but many of them pass into folk wisdom because folk wisdom recognizes the truth of biblical wisdom. Um, so he, but other examples of proverbs, not, also not in wisdom literature. So here, um, am I my brother's keeper? So to be your brother's keep, keeper is a proverb. In most languages that I know anyway, but I only know European languages that, that uh, passes in there. You're going to work by the sweat of your brow. Proverbial, everyone knows it. Um, or your sin will find you out. I see that written in papers. Your sin will find you out. Why? Probably because it also sounds karmic. Right? You're going to get what you deserve. Your sin will find you out. Uh, contemporary drama often breaks this. I'm thinking specifically of Game of Thrones. Bad guys don't get what they deserve. Good guys don't get that what they deserve. So it 
totally violates this principle of your sins will find you out. There's no moral teaching in that work whatsoever other than to contradict, contradict moral teaching, and everybody is aware of it, and they delight in the fact that it's presenting a world in which there is no place where your sins find you out. So it's not only godless, it, it denies uh, the moral fabric of creation. Uh, the phrase, the powers that be, is proverbial. Whatever a person sows, he will also reap. In Galatians 6, verse 7, a labor of love. 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, these are all uh, little uh, proverbial in, this, in the sense of uh, stichomatic, very brief expressions. But the aphoristic quality of Scripture is also proverbial. So in Psalm uh, 119, thy word is a a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, put into song, but it's well known and uh, represents uh, that sort of truth. So let's look at it as a, uh, as a literary form. As I say, it's remarkably concise, and because it's concise, it's memorable. I know people who memorize scripture and try some, I know people who memorized whole gospels. That's hard work. They're not meant to be memorized. It's good to memorize them, but they're not written to be memorized. They're written. If you do memorize it, you will benefit from it enormously because it bit, then you've internalized the word, you've chewed it over, it becomes part of your mental framework and your thinking along the lines that God has revealed himself in a way related to the life of Christ. It's great but it's not written for the purposes of being memorized, whereas I think Proverbs are. And part of the reason that we can do it is because they're brief. <laughs> it's easier to memorize a short passage. It's even easier if it's written in memorable language. It's even easier if it seems of immediate personal relevance. The reason people don't like memorizing poetry or anything for that matter is it doesn't it seems like an exercise in uh, masochism basically I'm making myself suffer to memorize this it's like learning a new language I have to memorize new words even though those words mean nothing to me they're just noises eventually they have meaning but it's a period of suffering to do that not so with proverbs proverbs immediately seem relevant and they seem easy to memorize so very attractive we in, we immediately are struck by the fact that it is worthy of being memorized um, so when things are simple we tend to overlook them and run past them ignore them when they're uh, and these are simple Proverbs are simple, and yet because they're generally valid and also because they're personally applicable, the simplicity, as I say, is, is uh, deceptive. We're, we're pulled into this aphoristic saying in a way that brings it back to mind over and over. So it's a conciseness in language, and it's a gift that, um, that almost nobody has anymore. To say something instantly memorable is what marketing campaigns do all the time. They want in a phrase or in a couple of words to convey an idea that will appeal very broadly to as many people as possible and they will be able to apply it to life. And it, often it breaks the rules of language in marketing. you know, Nike's a Just Do It or something like that. There's a variety. What it, what's the Apple one? Is it Think Smart or something like that, which is bad grammar? Because thinking is a verb and so it should have an adverb. It's just, or maybe it's just bad American English, I don't know. But it's, it's bad grammar. But it, it, it's captured a, uh, an idea which appeals. 
So there, there's a skill with words in choosing exactly the right words in exactly the right way. You're not expected to do, to do this in an essay because it's too long. It's too long for it to be have that sort of effect. But you can aim for it in phrases. And if you're a politician, you particularly want to do this. And even if you're a, a uh, public speaker, you want little quotes, right? And those are the aphoristic proverbial type of nuggets of wisdom. And the aim of the concentration of language then is to make an insight permanent. It's to make it solid. You know how people, some people talk and talk and talk and they never get to the point because they don't really have a point. It's almost like therapy for them. They are talking to make themselves feel better because you're thinking, I have no idea why this person is, is going on. What on earth is this? And I can't get away. I, I, I want to go to do this or that, and I, the person is talking, and you're like, when is this going to stop? And you're, you're waiting for that break in conversation so that you can, but they won't give the break. There's just, so you're going to be rude to interrupt it. And, oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> you laugh because you know what I'm talking about. This is the opposite. It's brief, and so there's a pause to reflect and you don't want to go away from it. So it fits to some degree what we observed in uh, about the uh, narrative, biblical narrative. I said that it, it was also concentrated. It was focused on an event and very briefly, concisely told. It doesn't go on at great length. If it goes at any length, the length is necessary to tell the story, but it's, it's just giving you the essential features of the story and it's not adding anything else. It's not giving you um, all the background questions. So I said it's uh, biblical narrative is fraught with background, to use uh, Eric Auerbach's phrase. You're wondering what the character's thinking. You know, what's he thinking when he, we're never told that. Because just the narrative, the, the dialogue between the characters, that's what we know they're thinking. But outside of that, they must be thinking something other than what they said. Yes, but we only have what they said. So it's, very, it's already boiled down. Only the essentials are left. Here we have it in relation to practical living. And the practical living examples that are in Proverbs tend to be reflected in what we read in biblical narrative. And the same sort of... Uh, characters are often presented in uh, wisdom literature of the proverb sort, so, sort. So we have certain types. We have we have a king. Kings are throughout scripture. There's even a book called Kings. Uh, we have the fool displayed all over the case, uh, all over the place in literature. People who are foolish. But we have a person called the fool. We have the sluggard, the lazy individual displayed. Uh, we have uh, the drunkard, somebody who escapes the world through drinking, he tries to uh, uh, euthanize away their pain. Um, but then we also get um, proverbs related to people in various social positions. So types of bureaucrats, functionaries, or uh, an evil society. So Proverbs will talk about an evil society at great length, and I'll, I'll look at this a little bit later, and if I don't, please remind me. Um, Proverbs 30, verses 11 to 14, talks about a whole society that uh, rejects wisdom. Doesn't reject knowledge, doesn't reject authority, but it does reject wisdom. It retains authority, it retains a sort of functional knowledge, but it, it wholly lacks wisdom, practicality for life. It thinks they can live life in, in, in another way. And uh, C.S. Lewis in The Abolition of Man, which you've heard me speak about, at least a few of you have, um, to some degree is giving us proverbial wisdom literature in a society that presents its knowledge to the young, but without wisdom. Uh, so what's the form of Proverbs? Well, in general, it relies on two different types of tropes. One is this 
uh, and, and we're aware of them already. One's a simile and, one, and the other's a metaphor. A simile says this is like that. It's a comparison. You hold two things side by side. This is like that. A metaphor says this is that. It's strong, it so strongly identifies with it, it's no longer two things, it's one thing. Uh, so I said that both of these are tropes. They're tropes in the sense that these are unusual uses of a word or a phrase or an image. It's unusual or surprising when these two things are compared together. So it strikes us because of that. That's why you uh, use certain images and or certain similes and certain uh, uh, metaphors because they arrest, they're arresting. When language uh, uses metaphors but is no longer observed to be metaphorical, then you need a new metaphor because you need to grab people's attention. Uh, sports broadcasters use metaphors all the time. And they're terrible. That was a game changer. You know, there's certain stock phrases over and over and over, and they don't use anything other than these terms. <coughs> At which point they no longer become metaphor, even though they are metaphorical, uh, we stop being aware that they are metaphorical and then just become tedious speaking from people who don't really think about what they're saying. It's a way of saying, I like this, I like this, I like this, pay attention to this, I like it. That's basically it. You may as well say that as well. So, um, it relies heavily on tropes, the tropes of metaphor and simile, and it employs parallelism. Now, parallelism is, you'll remember this from mathematics, you're drawing two parallels, a line. Two lines that run directly alongside one another. Oh, that one's close together, it's a bad parallel. But you get the point. It's two lines, things that are congruent, they run alongside one another. This is a way of uh, poetry works. Repetition. Two principles of poetry. One is repetition, the other is variation. There are different types of repetition. You can say think, this is, these two things are the same. You can say these two things are opposite. But it's still a parallel. It's like a black and white. Or a night and day, it's like night and day. And in scripture, you, these phrases then start to, uh, some of them are used to include everything. So as far as the east is from the west. Metaphorical language, it's a way of describing the fullness, the plenitude. I talked about Psalm 119 last time, I didn't go into it, but I said that it was um, written in a way that was, uh, had all the letters of the Hebrew alphabet in it. That's also a way of expressing pl plenitude. When God says that he's the alpha and the omega, it's the first letter in the Greek alphabet and the last. That means he's the beginning and the end. Right? It's a, it's a, a memorable, metaphoric way of expressing a theological doctrine, but it's, again, mem memorable. You could say that God is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. You can use the omni words. These are abstract. These are philosophical. If I, I say that God is the alpha and the omega, it conveys something very similar, but it's more memorable. Poetic language, metaphorical. If you can speak in metaphorical language, <coughs> you will oddly, and the metaphors are good and well chosen and wise, you will find that people will listen to you far more than if you talk about omniscience and omnipresence, etc. At that point, people's eyes rolls back, roll back in their heads. And some people in the room will be with you, but it's about 15% of your audience that are interested in thinking and abstraction. 
which philosophers do. Important that they do, by the way, but it's not. You can think in abstraction while expressing, expressing yourself in concrete ways. Uh, the best people to do this are the poets. So, <coughs> so it employs parallelism, parallelism and particularly antithetical parallelism. This is the lifeblood of Proverbs. Antithetical parallelism. And we saw that in Psalm 1, which is again wisdom literature. Blessed is the man, not so the wicked. Antithetical parallelism. Two men. One's on this path, the other's on this path. One's planted, the other will um, not endure. He'll be gone. Right? So there's two different individuals, two different outcomes. One will flourish, the other will pass away. So antithetical parallelism. When it talks about religious leaders, it talks about three types, and they are religious leaders that are often spoken of in Proverbs. Uh, one is the priests, the other are the prophets, and then finally there are those who are the wise men. So in Jeremiah 18.18, 18, let's see if I have this in the book here. It's here somewhere probably. Uh, it speaks about the priests, the prophets, and the wise men, those who give counsel. So there is no office of wise men in Scripture. There's an office for the priesthood. There's an office for the prophet. But there's no office for a wise man. And that's really interesting because wisdom is greatly valued in Scripture. And yet you cannot create an office for it. When you think about how important wisdom is in Scripture, how much it's spoken about the wisdom of God versus the folly of this world, etc., you would have thought that there would be a group that is devoted to wisdom and, and, and where it's cultivated. But I think, and so that the fact that there isn't makes it noteworthy. So it's valued highly, and yet there's no office associated with wisdom, and that's because wisdom seems to uh, exist in all the ranks. You can be a wise commoner. You can be a wise king. If you're a wise king, then your nation will be blessed. If you're a wise woman, then you'll be the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31. You're not going to get the acclaim that the wise king will. However, you're still acting in wisdom, and it's praised as such. But it's generalized there and presented, but then in a particular form. So there's no office of the, uh, the wise, which we find in Greek literature, the sophists. Those are the wise ones, so-called wise ones. In Greek philosophy, they call themselves philosophers. There are no philosophers in scripture. And where there are, they're being decried for their lack of wisdom. It doesn't come up often, but in Acts 17, we do have an encounter with the philosophers. And the philosophers are effectively being rebuked for lacking wisdom. I'll tell you about the God you don't know. I can see that you're very religious. You worship many gods. But I see that you have written there, there's a tomb to the unknown God. Let me tell you about that God, because you don't know them. For all of your wisdom, you've never heard of the only God that is actually a God. So there's great irony in the passage. Paul happens to be a, an apostle, and there's an, a, a prophetic aspect to his ministry, of course, but he's also wise. So you can be more than one category. So wisdom will go with kingship, with being a prophet, also a wise priest, also a wise wife, a wise son. A, so wisdom is, goes across the social ranks and across the spectrum, and everyone can be wise. Not everyone can be a prophet. Not everyone can be an apostle, but everyone can be wise. It's generally accessible. And it's a way to live a better life. The psychology industry of our day is trying to promote wisdom. And it does so in the form of therapy. 
but it doesn't promote a truth culture. It promotes a therapy culture. And they're not the same thing. The reason uh, I bring him up regularly because I find him interesting, the reason Jordan Peterson, uh, who unfortunately is a part of the therapy culture, is nonetheless appealing is because he has wisdom on top of being a psychologist. If he were only a psychologist, I would dismiss him, and so would everyone else. It's because he seems to have more wisdom than his discipline has created in him, and it's probably because of his own suffering and because of his own treatment of people with suffering. So he recognizes that there is a wisdom to the world and therefore counsels others because he cares about them as a good therapist counsels them in the paths of wisdom. Don't do this, do that. If you want to live a good life, here's certain things you should do. You're, here are my rules of life. That's wise counsel. And then you read it and think, these are pretty commonsensical. Yes, but nobody's saying them. And so he sounds like a prophet. He's not a prophet, he's, it's the voice of wisdom. But it's got nothing to do with the psychology. But people will listen to it because we live in a therapy culture and we look to uh, psychologists to direct us on how to live a happy life. Psychologists know nothing about living a happy life. Most of them live in broken families. Marriage counselors are the worst because they always have broken marriages, so now they're going to help other people uh, in their marriage difficulties. That's not really a good, you know, physician heal thyself. I'm not saying there's no value in this, but I'm just saying I've noted a common tendency here. Um, I mentioned these three classes of religious leaders. So the priests, the prophets, and the wise men, the first two have something in common. They have the stamp of being God's direct word to people. The priest acts in a direct way directed by God. They're particularly um, identified and it's an office that of the Levites from whom the priests come and the prophets are called directly by God there's a special burden placed upon the prophet and they speak directly to people whereas wisdom literature comes to us as a person's word to fellow humans that it seems to have less authority because one's directly from God there's no arguing with the prophet he doesn't need to persuade you. It is so. Thus saith the Lord. Bang. And whether you like it or not, it is so. It's not even... When, when Moses speaks to Pharaoh, he's not speaking wisdom. He said, this is what's happening, this is what's going on, or going down right now, and you will relent, or else. I won't. Okay? He's not trying to persuade. He's not saying, it, you know, Pharaoh, it would be wise for you to do this. It's just three days. Just, just give us three days and think about this and try and persuade him. He's not trying to persuade him. This would be wise counsel. You know, are you really going to push your authority on this one thing, one little thing? And if you just bend a little bit, you can have it both ways. Right? Just let them go for three days and worship me and then I'm done and that we'll come back and it's all over. No, nope, I will not let you go. That's it. So he's gonna, everything is gonna ride on not bending. And so he breaks, very unwise. He's the foolish ruler. He's a proverbial, he's the foolish ru ruler, uh, a proverbially foolish ruler. Not pragmatic at all. And but that's not wisdom literature, whereas wisdom literature comes to us just as a, not God's word, but as a person's word to other human beings, here's what you ought to do. Everybody's looking for this in our day. Because there's so little wisdom these days. Or where it is possessed, nobody listens. It's mostly your grandparents if they're around, because older people tend to be the repositories of wisdom. So it's, it tends to be associated with life experience boiled down when I talked about language boiled down a person's life is boiled down to a few phrases few paths or the 10 rules of life or whatever the number of rules are I didn't really I think there's 12 the 12 rules of life
And the, the truth that it conveys is truthfulness to life and to human experience. So as I say, Jordan Peterson uh, is, is wise in that sense. And what he says about scripture is simply wrong. But what he says about life tends to be right. What he says about scripture, I think you have no idea how to read scripture if this is how you're going to read scripture. This is not. You're, you're out of your field here to some degree. But what he's trying to do is to show that what scripture teaches is wise because he speaks as a character who has wisdom. And I can say, here's the, and I'm, but where he mistakes it is saying, I'm going to present it in the forms of psychology. It's not meant to be read that way. You can be wise without it fitting with psychology. Wisdom is a larger, larger category than personal application and therapy. And he's reducing the one to the other. It should be the other way around. Anyway, uh, enough about that and about him. Uh, let's talk about the book of Proverbs itself. And what, we, what is really interesting to me is that we can see not just scattered proverbs, but an evolution from one proverb to the next. There is a sense of uh, continuity and also of building on themes. And as I said, the themes are often antithetical. So the, the wise man and the fool, the king and the tyrant, the sober individual and the drunkard, the hardworking individual and the sluggard, the lazy individual. So again, these antitheses. And these don't fit very well in our culture because our culture does not want any differentiation between different paths in life. Diversity, inclusion, equality. The intention is that each choice should be praised and no choice should be despised. Proverbs doesn't fit with that at all. It's going to say, this is the way to a happy life, this is the way to a destructive life. This is the way to be, to be blessed and to bless others, this is a way to curse yourself, and this is a way other people will be harmed by your conduct. Proverbs speaks directly against the spirit of our age. And so we live in an age of folly then, that where folly is promoted as a virtue. This is a problem. Now, I'm going to deal, um, let's look at a few characteristic um, individuals. Um, I'll take them as exemplary in, uh, in the book of Proverbs written in the brief fashion that I talked about already. And then I'm going to come back and talk about Proverbs 1 to 9 as a unit, because they are to be taken as a unit. And then if I have time, I'll move on to Ecclesiastes. I'm not sure if I'm going to have time. But let me go to uh, Proverbs, not Proverbs 1. Although let me look at, actually, I'll read the introduction here. Because it sets the state. Oops. It was right. Oh, did I turn it off? I did turn it off. Okay, so just give it a sec. Must have pushed the wrong button. Uh, Proverbs uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 7 is a sort of a prologue, if you will, on wisdom. It tells the purpose of these Proverbs as well. So what's the purpose? The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion, a wise man will hear and increase learning. And a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma the words of the wise and their riddles. First one, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. First proverb presented in that brief aphoristic form is in Proverbs 1 verse 7. 
and it guides the whole of the rest of the book of Proverbs. A proverb is the key that unlocks the rest of Proverbs. Very suitable. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So already we're getting the same thing that we saw in Psalms. The righteous man, the fool, not, or the wicked. There it's presented in, in moral terms. Here it's presented more in terms of knowledge. Not so in, in the Psalms. The Psalms is more the righteous and the wicked. Here it's the knowledgeable and the foolish. But they're coterminous. The knowledgeable are the righteous. The wicked are the foolish. It's just one is presented in moral terms, as I say, and the other is presented in terms of right thinking and therefore right living. But it begins with the fear of the Lord. Now, it seems an odd place to begin with wisdom. And what it does is it directly then relates to what we said uh, 10 minutes ago or so when we were talking about Acts 17 where Paul speaks on the air, uh, on Mars Hill, the Areopagus, which is where the Greeks convened to uh, the Supreme Court of Greece met, more or less, and he's there debating the philosophers of the day, renowned for their wisdom, and says that they don't have any wisdom. Implies it, they're fools. It's the same sort of thing that Socrates says to the sophists as well. Here we don't have the sophists, we have the Epicureans and the, um, who else is there? Stoics, who are the civic-minded philosopher, school of philosophers, and says, you don't know about who God really is, and if you don't know who God is, then you can't know wisdom either, and you can't provide good counsel because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You can't even begin. So this is one of the things that is of question then when we're talking to people who are non-Christians is whether we should begin with a bridge to the um, idea of theology. Should we begin by getting laying a common ground? A common rational ground, moral law, and so forth. C.S. Lewis talks about it in the Tao, uh, or the abolition of man. He also talks about it in Mere Christianity. He talks about reasoning and, and the idea of justice, which we have in ourselves, as the beginning of going down this road. And I think, I think there's an argument to be made for it, for sure. And, um, and many people have been converted by Lewis's mere Christianity, found it very persuasive. They tend to be a certain type of individual, but um, yeah, I think it's more that he presents it in, in terms of wisdom, rather than the, than the trajectory that he chooses to write the book. But I don't, that's a bigger subject of, uh, uh, which I'll deal with in a different class. But what this says is that the beginning of knowledge is with the fear of the Lord. So you have to know that there is a God. Now, Lewis will do it through saying that there is a notion of justice, which we derive from the playground from the idea of fairness. When somebody says they, that's not fair to another child, they know immediately that the other child knows what fairness is and what injustice is. How did we get to know that there is such a thing as justice and injustice? Because it's innate in us because we are made a certain way and we're all made that same way and we expect the other person to know when we say that's not fair what fairness is. We don't have to argue them into that understanding. Well based on that and your sense that justice is important you can also from that make an argument that God exists as well. It's going to eventually build up there from that beginning point. The question is, is Lewis charting a different course than the one that's presented here, which is to talk about the fear of the Lord. And I think he is. He does it from reasoning, from a common ground. This is saying there is no common ground other than the ground where you are afraid of God to begin with. I think that apologetics is highly useful for defending the faith. Uh, for encouraging
Christians that their faith is rational and is defensible. I don't think it's useful for bringing, persuading people to become Christians. I don't think it does that. It might go alongside of it, but the persuasive thing is when somebody becomes aware that they're a sinner. And if they're a sinner, and there's, and, uh, and there is a God whom they already know because they know that fairness exists and justice, that, that God is judging them. I think that brings them to fear. And if they come to that point of fear, then they may seek knowledge at that point and start listening. In particular, they might start listening uh, to words that are claimed to be coming from God. Anyway, I say this, so does St. Augustine. Augustine, in uh, his, there's a sevenfold methodology in On Christian Teaching, uh, book two, there are four books. In book two, he talks about uh, instruction, and he begins with this. He doesn't begin with humility, he begins with fear, because this does. So you have to start with the fear of the Lord. Now, he speaks as an adult convert. Everyone likes to cite the tole, lege, take, and read, right? Where he hears children singing in the apple orchard. He hears children, and he goes, and what does he do? He goes to the Bible, and he reads it, and he is brought to faith there. So did that not persuade him? Well, when he comes to Christian teaching, he doesn't talk about the importance of going and reading the Bible. He talks about the fear of the Lord. What brought him to that point? He cites this instructive you can read the Bible as long as you want I think it's a good thing it will help you since it's God's revelation God can speak to you I wish more people would read the Bible even who are not Christians I think it would do them great benefit but they won't come to be saved if they don't believe that there is a God and they ought to fear him only at that point will they listen with the ears of faith to what they're hearing and the, and the fools will despise wisdom and instruction even if they're reading it. Right? So there, there we have there. So it begins with this, and, it, and the turning point seems to be the fear of the Lord. Not talked about much in churches these days. They want to persuade. There's an element of the being winsome. We need to be non-offensive. I've heard it and I've said it myself, you know, the gospel is offensive enough, let's not add our own offensiveness to it, so let's, you know, let's not be jerks. Fair enough, right, and, and, and good, but at the end of the day, it's actually, I've heard people who are enormously offensive who bring people to faith. <laughs> so it doesn't seem to have any effect. I, I think it's a general, generally a good thing in life not to be a jerk. It actually contradicts your Christian vocation to be a jerk because there's no humility in it and you're called to be humble and to be persuasive and so forth but it doesn't mean that you can't be a jerk and bring people to fear the Lord you can it happens don't be worrying about being winsome all the time so it begins with this and then it will move on and I'm going to jump over the rest of this and alongside of that th there will be a call to shun evil counsel we'll get to that uh, I'm going to skip over that for the time being and jump forward to Proverbs uh, 25 to look at the wise king. And then uh, if I have time, I'm going to come back here. But let me do it. I spent more time on the beginning than I wanted to. Proverbs 25. What do I have down here? Oh, verse 2 to 7. The men of Hezekiah copied it, so the great king Hezekiah came after Solomon. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. As the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of kings is unsearchable. Take away the dross from silver, and it will go to the silversmith for jewelry. Take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. 
Do not exalt yourself in the presence of the king, and do not stand in the place of the great. For it is better that he say to you, come up here, than you should be put lower in the presence of the prince, whom your eyes have seen. So this is a passage related to kings. Note the specifics here. Antithesis, right in the first uh, verse 2. What's the antithesis? The glory of God, the glory of kings. One conceals, the other reveals, or searches out at any rate. Remember how unsearchable are the depths of wisdom? Paul talks about this. They're unsearchable because the God, God, God conceals them. There's a limit to that, and it, yet it's our calling to search them, to press hard. There are hard verses in Scripture, and God rewards the, the, the wrestling with them. You don't have to wrestle with wisdom literature, by the way. Wisdom, this is the, the odd thing. You would, in, you would think that wisdom comes with wrestling, and it does, but wisdom literature is another person's wrestling, which you get without any work. However, the wisdom of what you're reading, you will get because you will apply it to your life, which will be hard work, and you will recognize that it is true of yourself and the world that it depicts. But there's the antithesis right away. It's the glory of God to conceal, the glory of kings to search out. And then the comparison continues as the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of kings is unsearchable. So note the uh, opposition or the parallel between concealing on God's part and the unsearchable in the, in the king's heart. The king's search, but his heart's unsearchable. Who knows the heart of the king? God alone. So this is an element that defies psychology and it defies real explanation but the, the the we're to pray for those who are in leadership because ultimately god has put them there in that position of leadership in our country by means of the ballot box and not by means of birth where, where a king would be but still god will ordain uh, elected officials to be in positions of leader their hearts and what moves them are unsearchable we don't know what really motivates them. They think that they know, but actually they don't because we will find that politicians are as movable as water. You can push them around. They, they want to please the crowd. They're looking at the opinion polls. They're listening to their counselors. They're thinking about what's practical, what's going to get them back into office, what can achieve their agenda. Okay, but these are conflicting motives. They wanted to help people. They want to do the right thing. There's a lot of different motivations that go into a person's decision. At the end of the day, what unites them all, we don't even know. It's unsearchable. But we're to seek wisdom. And by seeking wisdom, we have a solid foundation for very shaky motivations. And how do we get that king to be a good king? By taking away the dross. Well, you remove the folly from your own heart, but you also remove the bad counselors. Maybe that should be a prayer for people, not just to pray for those in authority, but pray that they have good counselors surrounding them. And that will go for churches, organizations, businesses, universities, you name it. Pray that they be wise, but also that they receive wise counsel and also that they expel the wicked from their midst. Take away the wicked from before the king, and his throne will be established in righteousness. It's not the king. It's the advisor. Think of how many bad advisors are presented in Scripture. Think of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, and he's got these court figures. Likewise in, with Pharaoh. He has men there, the religious leaders who are counseling him. You have counselors to listen to their counsel because he doesn't know what to do. It's difficult to be in a position of leadership. You feel the weight of uh, being God's vice regent on earth. You, are, you have an authority, but it's above your capacity to wield it. So you require counsel. 
Further application, do not exalt yourself in the presence of the king and do not stand in the place of the great, for it is better that he say to you, come up here, than that you should be put lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen. So let him bid you to come. Who follows this? Esther. There it's presented so strongly that anyone who comes in the presence of the king unbidden will die. She doesn't dare to do it. There's a death sentence. And she's already seen that the king is guided not by his own practical wisdom, but he follows the laws. You have said it is written, O king. Right? We've already seen that the king is a legalist. She knows that he's a legalist. This is a man who doesn't think for himself. He follows the rules. And the rule is if anybody comes into his presence unbidden, so does Esther want to go in? No, she's waiting to be invited. She can't be invited. Sure, she hasn't been invited, and she goes herself. This is foolish. She knows it's foolish, and she knows also that the king has demonstrated that he is foolish. He follows his own decrees. He thinks that he, what his words were, are effectively God's words. What's he going to do? Huge intrigue in the story. As in the end, he's pleased that she's come in and allows her, but she is on uh, the rack that night she does it. she's terrified of what's going to happen but perhaps God has raised you up for such a time as this but that's the contradiction of wisdom there and yet there it is wisdom it's a wise act that contradicts general wisdom you don't go to a king wait till you're bidden at that point fine so interesting so that's the wise ruler and how a king should behave let's look at a counter example let's look at the fool proverbs 26 now oh, i won't even bother with the title the fool is already being portrayed in uh, i'm not even going to get to it now so that's okay uh proverbs 1 to 9 at great length there are two types there's the faithful truthful uh, lady Wisdom, who speaks and calls out in the streets, and she's there, speaking just like the common man, like I said, commoners, anyone can be wise. It's in the streets, it's the street people. There's a wisdom among the populace. Wisdom does not go with being in the office of prime minister. You don't have to be in a, you don't need to be a professor to be wise. Most professors are not wise. They're knowledgeable, but they're not wise. Most prime ministers are not wise. They have power. Wisdom is to be found, but it could be in the prime minister. It could be in a professor. It could be on the streets. Wisdom is calling out in the streets. So is another lady in the streets, and she's an adulteress. And her words are a snare, and they will bring you down to hell. They will destroy you. There it's presented in two forms, two female forms. You can ignore the female form to some degree. I don't think it's saying that you know, women are always wise. Although it's interesting to see that Athena is the, late, the figure of wisdom in Greek literature and likewise in Roman. Wisdom's often personified as a woman. Why? Because you're to love wisdom. I think that's the reason why. It's not because women are wiser than men. Feminists may say so, but they're foolish if they do. It says I. You can accept whether it's true or not, if you like. I don't think wisdom, women are no wiser than, than men. Um, they are all, all have the potential for wisdom. Equally there, I think. But here we have the fool, which is elaborated on Proverbs 1 to 9, in, in, which is presented in terms of a, like a drama, where there are two parties, the wicked and the righteous. Here we have it in one person, the fool, and what does it say? It says, as snow in summer and rain in harvest, so honor is not fitting for a fool. What a great way of illustrating it. Like a flitting sparrow, like a flying swallow, so a curse without cause shall not alight. A whip for the horse, a bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the fool's back. It's appropriate. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, 
lest you also be like him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. He who sends a message by the hand of a fool cuts off his own feet and drinks violence. Like the legs of the lame that hang limp is a proverb in the mouth of fools. Like one who binds a stone in a sling is he who gives honor to a fool. Like a thorn that goes into the hand of a drunkard is a proverb in the mouth of fools. The great God who formed everything gives the fool his hire and the transgressor his wages. As a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for him. That's the end of the passage that's devoted specifically to the fool. But the most foolish of all fools is the man who is wise in his own eyes. Go back to what I said about Proverbs in Proverbs 1 verse 7. Remember it says elsewhere, the fool says in his heart there is no God. It's one of the Psalms. The person who thinks that he's wise of himself is the greatest fool of all fools because he, does, he thinks that he's wise. But it doesn't say that it's more foolish. He says there's more hope for a fool because at least a fool is treated as a fool and is called a fool. Whereas the wise man is given the high praise of being wise, even though he is a fool. There's no hope for such a person. So look at these, uh, and again, they're aphoristic. They're quite brilliant. Let me focus on this passage here, the, the uh, immediate contradiction here. So we get, uh, and I did it again. The uh, antithesis. But here the antithesis is in how to respond. Well, you don't answer a fool according to his folly because you'll be like him. And yet you do answer him lest he be wise in his own eyes. Now, are those contradictions? Of course they are. Because they're given counsel to do the exact opposite thing. One is you don't answer and the other is you do answer. But the purpose of the answering is different. The one is it's dangerous to you to engage in debate with a fool or arguing or answering tit for tat. It's dangerous for you to do that with a fool. On the other hand, it's advantageous to him. So in the midst of this, where of these two lines that are saying the exact opposite, there is a different purpose intended here. To engage with fools in debate is which is what you're going to do if you're in a debate with non-Christians in the public square. You're engaging with fools. You have to be careful that you be, don't become a fool like they do, like they are. By coming down to a certain level of discourse or even the terms of reference. Let's have a debate in which we can't talk about God. So here's the conditions. Let, you can be in the debate, but we're going to be, let's start with some ground rules. No appeals to God. We can't talk about this at all. But we can have a, we can have a fulsome debate on those premises. Okay. This is going to be a problem for you because you're not going to be able to appeal to the very thing that differentiates wisdom from folly by doing this, by acknowledging that there's a God and we need to fear him and li lives need to be directed towards him. This is a problem. On the other hand, if we don't engage in that debate, the fool goes away uh, thinking he's wise. So there, it's good for him, the person you're speaking to, but it's not necessarily good for you. Now, there's wisdom in the midst of the contradiction between those two. Can you handle the contradiction? So there's a danger in engaging with fools, even for the wise. 
C.S. Lewis said uh, memorably that he was never less convinced of a of Christian orthodoxy than when he won a debate on the subject. That's not a direct quote, but something about defending the tenets of Christianity in public when he trounced his opponents, he was never less convinced than after he'd had the victory. Why? Because his pride rose up. He knew he'd won the debate. And so there was something that contradicted in his heart the sense of humility and the fear of the Lord because now he wasn't quite so fearful and he was feeling pretty strong and feeling pretty proud of himself. And there was an element of personal contradiction there that he felt the difference. It's not that he was... So he won the debate, he persuaded everyone in the audience, and he walked away defeated, but there was a danger there. He was less convinced after than he was before. I think that's what he's talking about here, that sense of danger to the person that is engaging, while at the same time doing a great deal for his audience. Same what goes with teaching that, more broadly. There's a reason why teachers are held more accountable to a stricter judgment. Uh, let me go to the evil society, because I'm running out of time. I won't, I'll skip over the sluggard, the lazy person, which is interesting there. So again, it, it implicitly uh, demonstrates what I said in Rome, or sorry, in Genesis 1, that work is a human good. It comes before the fall, not after the fall. If you look at the pagan accounts, work is a punishment uh, for being human. It's to be avoided. And, and the golden age is a place where nobody works. That's not the biblical view. God tells people to work right from the beginning. The fall makes it full of thorns and thistles, but it remains good. It's just going to be less fruitful. It's going to be harder still good and this is demonstrated in wisdom literature in the person of the sluggard the lazy one who can't get out of his bed you know sleep for another hour let me just hit the alarm snooze for another hour and do that every day never get out of bed never do anything it's elevating the significance of work then and the wisdom of working but let me focus on the evil society i said i would do that proverbs 30 verses 11 to 14 There is a generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. There is a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed from its filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are like swords and whose fangs are like knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. This is talking about the wicked society, an evil society. It's presented in very general terms. It doesn't say when it will be. It's describing what it will be like. And it uses this uh, poetic device called anaphor. There is, there is, there is, there is, four times. Introduces it. The fourfold repetition obviously uh, works like a, uh, it builds up to a climax. It's going somewhere, but it's strongly emphasizing there is a generation. And the generation, you could talk about human humanity in general. This generation will not pass away, says Jesus, right? And the generation re refers to humanity. It's not referring to those living in his day till these things are fulfilled. Some will say that it does. I think that it's more generally true. This seems to be general, and yet it seems to be very specific because this is a generation that curses its father, does not bless its mother. In other words, it's, this is not antithetic parallelism. It's, this is just parallelism. This is two ways of saying the same thing. If you, won't, if you will curse your father and you won't bless your mother, you're cursing both of them or you're not blessing both of them. There's a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed from its filthiness. Now, this ties in with the first statement. It's building on it. It curses its parents and regards itself to be exempt from those same curses, even if it has children, because we're better than the past. It, it has a 
disdain for those that bore them. You've heard me talk about the animus against fathers in literature and the cult of the orphan promoted in literature. That's a part of it. It's pure in its own eyes, but, and yet it's not washed in its own filthiness. So it's hypocrisy. There is a generation whose eyes are lifted up. They look up and they think the, of themselves as gods, more or less. They're very pleased with themselves. But finally, not only do they have contempt for the past, in their immediate past, their parents, they also have contempt for the poor. Their teeth are like swords. Remember I talked about similes? Teeth like swords, fangs like knives. They're going to devour them. They're not going to care about the poor. They're not going to care about the needy. They're going to gobble up everything themselves. They become greedy. It's describing a wicked society. And there are certain features there, and there's a building on it. It starts with parents. It ends with those around us who ought to be of our care and concern and treats them equally contemptu contemptuously with curses rather than blessings. No compassion. No fear for the Lord. Because the Lord tells us to look after the widow and the orphan, the poor. Right? That's there. It's not there before their eyes. And yet they think, 12 and 13, that they are pure and wise. I suspect that this passage has resonated at various times in various ages. It's not, it does seem to generate to resonate in our age particularly strongly. But I'm sure there have been previous generations where it would likewise be so, although I don't think it's always been so. But we are in one of those ages, I think. And the poor and the needy are growing by the day, it seems. Anyway, uh, I think I'm done for today. Uh, apologies for not getting to Proverbs 1 to 9, but uh, we're out of time.